All right, so as you all know, uh, I just got back from my trip out to Old Path Baptist Church and then Steadfast on Thursday and Friday, and it was a great time. And on Thursday at Old Path, I, I preached a sermon about you know, becoming a member of the church and really getting plugged in was, was the goal I was trying to, to, to preach there. And, and, you know, if people were there, not, you know, hadn't been going there very long, maybe just to make the decision to get plugged in and to really become a member. You know, church isn't a place that you just check off your list as attending once a week and just said, well, I did my duty because I know I need to go to church. So I just did that. Now, if you're not going to church regularly, you need to be doing that, right? Habits are good to become, to make a part of your life so you can make sure you're at the very least doing some form of a minimum service to God, right? We know we, know we need to pray. We know we need to go so We know we need to go to church. And, but we don't want to have it happen is just fall into some routine where that just, well, we just have to go to church, check it off. Okay, done. That is not the point of church. <laughs> There is so much value and there's so much to gain of coming to church and not just coming to church, but being a member of the church. So in that sermon, we went over 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you don't have to turn. I want you to stay here in Philippians chapter 2. But in 1 Corinthians 12, it goes all over all the various spiritual gifts that God gives. And it talks about being a member and how each member of a body is extremely important. Right? The various members, you have eyes, ears, nose, mouth, every little piece, it all serves its own function. And you, as members of this church, serve an important function in your own right, in your own aspect, in your own role within this church. Every member is important for the entire body to do great things, for the entire body to be at full strength and to serve the Lord completely. There, you know, we see people who are handicapped, people who have one leg, you know, they can do work, but it's a lot harder and they're not going to get as much work done. It's just a fact of life. They can't get as much done, especially in physical areas, doing things as other people because they have limitations. Well, when we have, you know, members of our church that aren't really members or people that just show up and aren't really being a member and saying, hey, here I am. Here's a gift I have. Here's some service I can do to contribute to the whole body. You know, and, and you, you may think it's just some small thing, but it's not. Every small thing is very important as a collective. We have a whole group here. We have a full body, and we need to be able to use all of our resources to get as much done as possible. And when, and when we have members that are, that are lame, right, that aren't really doing anything. It's going to be more of a hindrance than anything. We want, we want to, to get the members involved and then get plugged in, get plugged into the common goals of the church. And I'm not saying we have that problem here. I'm just saying that it's very important and we need to understand that church is a family. It's a body. It's not just a place that you attend, hear a little bit of preaching, sing a couple songs and go home. At least that's not what this, this church is about. That's not who we are here. We actually have a body here. This is the body of Christ, body of born-again believers. And, and we do have a common goal. There is something that we're working for here. And I'm going to read for you from Ephesians 4.11. I use this all the time. I, I use this when I'm going out soul winning. And I want to explain the importance of coming to church. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There's many reasons why we need to go to church. And then he goes on and says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, so we need to be learning in church. But what I want to point out here, because I don't want to re-preach that entire sermon, but it, excuse me, it fits in to what I'm preaching about this morning. This morning, I'm basically doing kind of a combination of both sermons a little bit that I preached at Old Path and Steadfast. But coming to church, what God gave pastors, God gave teachers in order to, for the perfecting of the saints, to help make you more complete, to help make you more um, fulfilled in doing the work of Christ. It says for the work of the ministry, and ministering is, is doing work for other people, right? God gave uh, uh, pastors and teachers and evangelists for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is the body. 
This is the church. And we are here to help build you up and strengthen you and to edify you to do more. And this church is a church that works. We are looking to work. We need to strengthen our church family. We want this body, this body of Christ that we have right here to be a strong body. We want to be able to do as much as possible. We need to be working out all of our members in order to be strengthened to have a strong church family. Now, I issued a challenge, if you're not aware of this, to Steadfast Baptist Church. And I'm issuing the same challenge here today. I already told them that we're bringing this challenge back here. It's not something I'm just going to put on them and make them do without you know, having it done here also. And we're going to use this as a source of edification too, knowing that, hey, they're going to be involved in the same work that we're doing. In a completely other state, we have a whole other body doing, doing the exact same thing that we're going to be doing here. And the challenge is for the entire month of February, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm going to be asking you to do is to try to give the gospel to at least one person every single day. Now, I'm not saying you have to get someone saved every day. I'm just saying attempt to give the gospel. Now, the goal behind this is to change and to transform our minds into the way that we think about people, about the lost in general. We have soul winning times here, and they're great, and I encourage everyone to come and be a part of that. And I think it's extremely important. We're never going to get rid of soul winning times. It is very important to have the time set up to where you say, I am going to make sure that I'm dedicating some time to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that is not the end, should not be the end result of your walk with God and your Christianity and your life. I am try striving to get you to become a soul winner at heart as not just something that you do on certain days, but something that's who you are. Someone who can look at lost people and have your spirit stirred up within you and say, this person needs to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the goal is that you need to be consciously thinking, because let's be honest, if you're not thinking about giving the gospel to somebody, you're not going to do it. You come into contact with people all the time. And I've had this happen to me before, too. You meet someone, you're talking, you're doing business, you're doing whatever, and then they leave. And then you think to yourself, oh man, that would have been a good opportunity to give them the gospel after the fact, after it's already over. See, I don't want that to continue to happen in my life. I don't want to miss these open doors and these opportunities that God has given me where someone has come into my path and just blow it. I mean, how do I know if maybe I am that minister unto whom that person would believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? And God has just made it so that they're right there, and then you're not even thinking about it. It's not even crossing your mind. Well, with a challenge like this, this is something I want you to put at the forefront of your mind and think every single day, hey, we've got this challenge. Hey, here's what we're supposed to be doing every single day. We're gonna, I need to find somebody to give the gospel to. That's going to help, them, and we're going to do it for 28 days. Now, don't be upset. A whole month, look, I picked February. February is the least amount of days in all the months, so it makes it a little bit easier on you, all right? We could have done it in, like, December. We could have done it some other time, but no, we're doing it in February. You got 20. It's not even a leap year, right? It's not, is it? No, <laughs> no it's an odd year. It's definitely not a leap year. So... 28 days, and what we need to be doing is looking and finding and making opportunities to approach somebody and at least ask them, hey, do you know 100% for sure if you die today that you're going to heaven? And my challenge is, I believe it's pretty light because I'm not even challenging you to have to go through the entire gospel with somebody. I'm saying attempt the gospel with somebody every single day. Now, a greater goal is to get through the gospel with somebody. And even a greater goal would be get a person saved every day. But I want to start with this challenge. And this is the same exact challenge I issued to Steadfast. Try to give somebody the gospel. And again, the whole point is so that we could change our minds. So we could be thinking about this on a regular basis because this is 
the most important thing that we do with our lives. There's a lot of things that we do in our life that are important. Don't get me wrong. Your family's important. Your job's important. You know, other things are important. Attending church is important. You know, doing all these various things are important. But we need to make soul winning a regular part of our lives. In Philippians chapter 2, very, very powerful passage. We started off in, he starts off at the beginning of the chapter talking about basically Christ's attitude, the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ and who he was and what he did for us. I want you to look down again. We're going to start reading in verse number one. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, of any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. We ought to have the love of Christ. We ought to have the love towards the lost. We ought to have this love as a part of our lives. Verse number three, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is the mindset that Jesus Christ had. He was always thinking about other people. Jesus Christ always put other people above himself. And I, you, know, you may think, well, I'm real busy. I've got all this other stuff going on in my life and I just don't have any time. What do you mean you want me to give the gospel to somebody every single day in the month of February? Don't you know how much I have to do? That is not the mindset that Christ had at all. Like I said, I know that there are things that, are, that, that you have that could be important to do. But let's consider Jesus Christ, who could have said, I've got some really important work to do. Don't you know I'm the King of kings and Lord of lords? But Jesus Christ humbled himself. And instead of coming to this earth and ruling and reigning, which he will do when he comes again, he came as a servant. Why? To show us what we need to be doing. To love us to set forth the example and say, hey, this is the mindset I want you to have. I want you not to be so concerned about yourself. I don't want you to do everything through strife and just fighting and vain glory and puffing yourself up. Why don't you humble yourself and care about other people and go out there and do some work for them? God in the flesh made himself of no reputation to serve other people. And you know what happened as a result in that? Verse number nine, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you could live this life and try to transform your mind into being a humble person and to be concerned about the, the well-being and, and the cares of other people, instead of just always focus about yourself, God will lift you up. You don't need to worry about being lifted up. Later on, he'll do that for you. We need to make sure we're kept low in our own minds. We need to, to stay humble and focused on other people. Because when you're focusing on yourself, do you know what happens? That's when you start to get proud. That's when you start thinking more and more of yourself when the more you're just thinking, well, I'm important, I'm this, I've got this to do, I've got, you know, and you stop thinking about other people, that's when you start to become proud. Let's see, there's one other point I wanted to make from this chapter. I don't have any of this in my notes. Um, look at verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, 
that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We are lights. We're shining lights. This is a dark world. There's a lot of lost people out there. There's a lot of wickedness, a lot of darkness. We are lights. We have the light of the gospel inside of us, and that light needs to be shined forth on a, reg on a daily basis. Not just a regular basis. I believe on a daily basis. This is something that we need to be doing regularly. I want you, I'm going to keep on reading and, and, do, and make a couple points from here. But while I'm doing that, turn, if you would please, to Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter 17. In the rest of this chapter, the Apostle Paul goes on to, to mention a few people. He mentions Timotheus, who he's sending. He says, uh, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. Why? Because the Apostle Paul cared about the people at Philippi, about the church at Philippi. He cared about them. And he cared about them enough to send somebody to say, Hey, go check on them. I'm sending Timotheus. He's someone I could, is a faithful servant, someone I could trust, someone I love, someone who's a fellow laborer with me to go out and check up on you guys. And I need, I want to be comforted knowing how you're doing. Because Paul's praying for them. He cares about them to write for them. He's esteeming the people of Philippi better than himself in his efforts and his ministry and service towards them. And he's sending other people who are like-minded. He says in verse 20, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. And think about that. These people, the church of Philippi, they belong to Jesus Christ. He said everyone else is just seeking their own. They just care about their own life. They're not focused on the things that are Jesus's. And when you focus on things that Jesus is like, he is here, the church at Philippi is Jesus Christ. He says in verse 22, but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. He's talking about Timotheus, who he's sending to them. He's saying, you know that this is a good man. You know that he's just like me in his uh, ministry and his work with the gospel. And then he goes on and talks about Epaphroditus who was sick and how he cared about the church of Philippi also. And he cared about him so much that um, you know, he wants to make him know that he's okay. But um, what's interesting about him is that it re he reveals in verse number 30, he says, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Epaphroditus was a man who cared about the things of God and the things of Christ so much and had this mindset in him that esteemed other better than himself that he was willing to put his life on the line and came very close to dying through the work of Christ. It says, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death. So he was willing to work and work and work to the point to whatever happened here. We don't know exactly the specifics on what happened, whether he was being persecuted, whether people were, you know, were, were trying to kill him. We don't know. Or whether it was just his health. He had worked so hard that he had, he had gotten to the point of exhaustion. I don't know what it is. But he is, the point is that his mindset was on other people's and helping other people to get um, to receive the benefit. And specifically, he was, it seemed that he was um, supplying the lack of the church at Philippi towards the Apostle Paul, and he was helping out the Apostle Paul. So um, this is the mindset that we need to have, and this is a mindset we need to have going forward. You're in Acts chapter 17. This is, we're going to see many examples in the book of Acts. There are many examples. I'm not going to turn to them all today. But you see how the book of Acts is all about soul winning. It's all about turning the world upside down with the doctrine. It's all about doing the work of Christ. Look at verse number 1 of Acts chapter 17. The Bible reads, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again, from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and, and, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude of the chief women, not a few. Paul, as his manner was, went into him, it says in verse number two. That was his manner. That's just the way he was. You see, someone, you see the Apostle Paul, 
And he's out there. He's disputing with the Jews. He's telling that Jesus is the Christ. Oh, yeah, there's Paul. That's what Paul does. That defines the Apostle Paul. He's someone that you, you could go look around. Where's Paul at? Oh, he's probably over there giving the gospel to somebody. That's how his manner was. There's no reason why your manner can't and shouldn't be the same exact way. Have that manner. Say, tell, if you say, tell me a little bit about brother so-and-so. Tell me a little bit about brother Sebastian. Tell me a little bit about brother Robert. Tell me a little about Pastor Burson Zerud. Tell me a little about you know, any, of, you know, any of the women in the church. It doesn't matter. Just, you know, you know, sisters, sisters, anybody. Let me know about those people. Well, do we know what their manner is like? What, what, are their manner, what is their manner like? They, they like to give the gospel. They're out soul winning all the time. They love other people. They esteem other people better themselves. They're a true servant. They're a minister at heart. This is the way that Paul's manner was. And he ended up accomplishing probably more than just about any other Christian that's ever lived that we, that we have recorded. And it's definitely in the scripture. He's done so much for the cause of Christ. Jump down to verse number 15 here in Acts chapter 17. Oh, and one other point, I don't think I made this. When I was talking about the church and being a church member, in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you know what one gift that's not mentioned there is preaching the gospel. You don't need a special gift to preach the gospel. That is not something that God gives to some people and not to others. Preaching the gospel is, is a commandment. It's something that we are all supposed to do. The, the ministry of reconciliation is committed unto all believers. That is all of our jobs. Now, you may have different obstacles to overcome that will help you to do that better. There's, there's skills you can learn. There's, you know, there's definitely a lot to, to make yourself a better soul winner. But the job has been given to all of us, and it's not something that you can say, oh, I don't have that gift. Well, nobody has that gift because that's not a gift that's given. It's something that we're all supposed to do. So don't think that there's, oh, this church, well, these people are soul winners and these people are not. No, everybody should be a soul winner. You have various gifts according to what God's given you. None of those is, uh, is a soul winning gift. If, somebody's, if you find someone that's really good at soul winning, it's because they worked at it. It's because they put forth a lot of effort. It's because they study their Bible. It's because they're, they're studying to show themselves approved unto God. It's because they're practicing. It's because they're going out and doing it more and more and more. That's why. That's why you see some people who are really good at soul winning. It's not just some gift. It's work. And if you take up this challenge, I guarantee you, you'll be a better soul winner than you were at the beginning. The soul winner that you are today, if you can do this and, and try to preach the gospel for 28 days in a row, you're going to be a better soul winner than you were before. Jump down to verse number 15. We're going to see a little bit more about Paul's character and who he was. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So Paul sends out to Silas and Timotheus and says, hey, I need you guys to come here. I'm in Athens right now, and I need you guys to come and join me here to do some work. Look at verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, so as a result, so we don't see the Apostle Paul just kicking back and saying, all right, well, when these guys get here, we're going to do some work, right? Now, look, when the guys get there and he gets to work, wouldn't that be a good thing? Of course. Great, right? I mean, he's there to do some work. But we don't see him just kind of going about and doing some sightseeing and just taking a vacation and doing whatever. And even if he was, look at what happened. Let's say he was doing that. Let's say he's going out. He's like, I'm going to go check out the sites while I'm waiting for him to get here. Look at how his manner was. It says, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. His spirit's just moving. It says, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So he starts walking around. He's like, man, these people are idolatrous. Look at all these idols out here. Look at all these false gods. Look at all these images. Therefore, so as a result of this bothering him, he's looking at this like, man, this is bad. Verse number 17, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. So as a result, he sees this wickedness, he sees the idolatry, and he says, something needs to be done about this, and he's out daily preaching Christ again. And that's what it says, no, it says, in the market daily. 
every single day the Apostle Paul was doing that, and he was still waiting for his guys to show up to do some other great work, right? To preach the gospel more, whatever they had planned. And one other point about this too, you know, and, and I brought this up at Steadfast. He was in the market daily with them that met with him. He's talking to people that want to listen to him, that will have a conversation with him. He's not standing there with a big sign that says, turn or burn, you know, turn from your sins, you're all going to hell, and just yelling at people. He met with people in the market daily. And why in the market? Because there's a lot of people there. Because there's people conducting business, there's people going shopping, doing all this stuff back and forth. There's a lot of people there. So he has the opportunity to reach a lot of people in one place. And we need to get and see, I want, I want you, in order to, to accomplish this goal, in order to fulfill this being a regular soul, because the Apostle Paul was a soul winner at heart. His spirit was stirred within him. And he says, these people need the gospel. They need to hear about Jesus. He didn't just fall back onto the one method of knocking on doors. And look, I'm not bashing door knocking. We're going to do it. We're going to continue to do it. We're going to do it until I cease to be pastor of this church and hopefully beyond that. I don't know. But that is going to be a method that's never going to quit. It's a biblical method. However, that is, should not be the only way that you preach the gospel. You can't just think, well, if I need to preach the gospel, I need to just go out and knock on doors. No, you don't have to do that. And if you're going to be preaching the gospel every single day, like this challenge is, it's going to be harder to go out and knock on doors. It's a lot easier to just find somebody and to stop. And I'll tell you about the, the challenge. And the reason why I even thought about doing this challenge is because, you know, obviously I needed to prepare a sermon that I was going to preach at Steadfast. And since I've never been there before, I've never been the old path before either, but I know Brother Donnie really well. Even I were real good friends while he was attending Faithful Word. We were both there as just church members, but we have very kindred spirits. You know, neither one of us was a pastor at the time or anything like that. We would just love God. We, you know, we loved the church and, and we were good friends. And he came to me with a challenge and he issued me a challenge of saying, hey, let's, let's try to get one person saved every day for a week. And I thought that was really good. And you know, you know something about that challenge? It made me really uncomfortable. You get to a point where you just get real comfortable, right? You've got your routine. You go to church, show up to soul winning time, read my Bible, and everything's going good. But when you start to get too comfortable, watch out. You're going to start to backslide. You start getting real comfortable. You let things slide a little bit. Well, I'm still doing pretty good. And before you know it, you're going backwards and backwards and backwards and the speed accelerates the more you go. The Christian life is not one of comfort. When, when, the, when the man asked Jesus Christ, hey, I want to follow you wherever you go. What did Jesus tell him? He says, look, the foxes have dens you know, and, the, and the birds have nests. He says, but the Son of Man is not where to lay his head. He said, I, I don't even have a home. You want to follow me? Great, but, but understand what you're getting into. You want to be a disciple of Christ, you want to be a follower of Christ, that's not going to be comfortable. It's not comfortable not to have a home, to be going around all over the place and sleeping out and, you know, and, and wherever, wherever you find place, whether it's in someone's house or not, what, you know, that's not comfortable. It's comfortable to have a home place to go to. It's comfortable to have everything set up. It's comfortable to have a nice soft bed and a fluffy pillow and a heater. That's comfortable. Doing the work that Jesus has to do is not comfortable. And you know what? Sometimes we need to just push ourselves. And these challenges like this are great. I, when, when he said that to me, I just thought, I'm like, man, this is, this is awesome. Is it uncomfortable? Yeah, it is. Because you know what? Now it's going to make me do all this extra work. I already have a family. I already work in full time. I'm already doing what I'm doing for church. But this pushed me that much more. Now, I'll be honest with you. I didn't accomplish the challenge. I didn't get somebody saved every single day. There was actually, I think, even one day where I didn't, I didn't give the gospel to anybody. But you know what? More people got saved during that week that wouldn't have gotten saved otherwise because I did get somebody saved. He got people saved. You know, like, like we did go out and put forth the effort and it was very edifying towards each other. And this is a great example of just, you know, Another reason why church is so important and coming to church and making these friendships because 
Pastor Anderson didn't even know anything about this chapter. I mean, this was just something between us and the church. To do more, to push ourselves more, to just to, to do this work. You're not going to get that, you know, and people who are listening online that aren't going to a church anywhere. I don't, I don't address the internet very often, if, if ever. It's probably the first time. You know, you don't understand what you're missing by not being in a church. It's not just the preaching. There's way more to church than just listening to a pastor preach. If you're listening to sermons online, you are not in church. You can learn a great deal. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. We post them online for a reason. But there is so much more to a church than just the preaching. The church is the entire body. The pastor is just one member of that body. You're missing out on the whole body when you're not in church. So we had this challenge, and, and that's what, what really st it stuck out in my head for a long time. I mean, even to this day, that was I don't know how many years ago when we both did that. But this is the reason why I decided to say, hey, let's have another challenge because it's motivating. Now, is it going to make you uncomfortable? I hope so. I don't want you to get too comfortable. I want to be able to keep pushing forward. I want to see how much we can do. But as I said there, I'm going to say it here again. I don't like preaching about failure. I don't think that you're going to fail. I don't think there's any reason to fail. I don't think you should even have it in your mind that you're going to fail. But I'm going to tell you this from the beginning. If you miss a day for whatever reason, don't miss a day. If you miss a day for whatever reason, don't just stop then and say, well, the whole month is ruined. Don't do it. Stick with the spirit of what we're trying to do here. There's a bigger goal than just the, again, it's not just a, a checkbox. Receive the goal, the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish as a church by, by trying to preach the gospel, of changing our minds to the way that we think about people that we come in contact with on a regular basis and just look at them and say, hey, this person probably needs to hear the gospel. So we don't miss opportunities so that we're not just letting everything go. Jesus provides a great example with the woman at the well. We're not going to turn there. But Jesus Christ himself, when he was weary, the Bible says he was weary and he sat down and his disciples went off to go get some food and, and he, was, he was exhausted from his travels. But even at his exhaustion, even at the end of a long day's work, he still didn't just stop soul winning. He saw somebody that needed to hear the gospel and he thought about them. See, it's easy, especially when you get tired, we get weary to say, I'm too tired. I don't want to go out. I just worked a long day at work. I need to rest. People still need to hear the gospel. Jesus Christ gives us that example. He was weary. He sat himself down and got into the situation where there was the Samaritan woman that came. And of all people, right, a Samaritan woman. At least back then, according to the Jews, they looked down on the Samaritans. They, they didn't have anything to do with them. They viewed them as, as lesser people. But Jesus said, even while I was weary, gave her the gospel. And what happened with her? The, again, a great example. She gets saved. What's the first thing she does? She drops her bucket Forgets about the work that she was there to do to begin with, to go and draw some water from the well, and goes out and leads people to Christ, saying, hey, I, I talked to this man here. Isn't this who we're looking for? Isn't this the Messiah? Isn't this the Christ? He told me all things that ever I did. Isn't this him? No training. Didn't go to church and go through classes and do all the soul winning workshops and stuff. She led people to Christ right away. So I don't care what your skill level is. Don't think, well, I've never been out soul winning to one of your soul winning times before. I've never done this before, so I, therefore I can't take part in this challenge. Yes, you can. Are you saved? Do you know how you got saved? I sure hope so. <laughs> if you don't know how you got saved, then, then you might need to check and make sure you're saved. If you know how you got saved, you know what salvation is, you can explain that to other people. And I'll just encourage you, though, don't, you, you got to use God's word. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. John 3.16 is an awesome verse. And some of you have heard over and over and over again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the gospel. 
Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins when he died on that cross. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish by everlasting life. Everlasting life lasts forever. All you got to do is explain that to someone. Show it to people. Get started doing it. Take part in this challenge. This challenge is for everybody. Everybody can do this, but it's, it's going to require you to have a willing heart, a willing attitude. It's going to require you to make the extra effort to push forward and say, I will do this. Here I am, Lord, send me. I am, I am willing to do this work for you. I may be nervous. I may be scared. I may not know exactly what I'm doing. But God, I'm going to do this work for you and I'm going to make a try. I'm going to make an attempt because that's what the challenge is. Attempt. Give the gospel to somebody once a day. Now I think about this. I, we're not gonna, I'm not going to have you turn there again for sake of time. I want you to turn to... Um, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says in Luke 12, 48, But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. The more opportunities you have, the better surroundings you have, the better church you have, the better teachers you have, the, the more you have God's word at your fingertips, the, you know, the, the more that you have given to you, the more God's going to require of you. There is a lot involved to that. I think about this, you know, we live a, in a great time in history. And, and I mentioned this there too at Sedfest that it's amazing how much work can be done in such a short period of time. Think about the differences now just in technology, just the way that the life is different than it was back then. To reach so many people, I was able to preach here on Wednesday night. I was able to preach in San Antonio, Texas on Thursday night. And I was able to preach in Fort Worth, Texas on Friday night. I was able to go out soul winning on Saturday in Fort Worth and be back here and preach this morning in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Do you know how long that would have taken to accomplish just what, what I accomplished for the Apostle Paul? I mean, it, it would have taken an extreme amount of time, right? It's a different world. We have, we have so many advances. We have the technology, the video, the stuff. You know, we could reach masses and multitudes of people that they probably never dreamed was ever going to be possible. Because we have the ability to do these things, God has now placed a greater burden on us. He says, okay, you've been given all this stuff. Now use it. Now I'm requiring more of you. We need to make sure that we can meet and, and use the tools that we have available and not just get comfortable and, and not use any of it or just use it for our entertainment and pleasure as opposed to doing a work for Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, is a, it should be an encouraging verse, occurring, encouraging pas passage for those of you that are still unsure about this challenge and think it's difficult and think, I don't know if I can do this. This will help to get you in the right mindset. Hebrews 12, verse number 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And he's saying, you know, unless you get wearied, in your minds, thinking that this work is too hard, there's too much stuff. He said, I want you to consider Jesus. 
the author and finisher of our faith. Think about him and what he did. Think about how he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. What that must have been like for God in the flesh, for the perfect human being to be faced with all these sinners and to love them enough that, that, yeah, us sinners, we rightfully deserve a punishment. We rightfully deserve to be crucified on that cross and for our souls to go to hell. That's what we deserve because we're sinners. But Jesus Christ endured all that because he loved us. He was beaten. He was whipped. He was mocked and ridiculed. He allowed and suffered the death of the cross, which is a shameful death for the king of kings, and for his soul to descend into hell to pay for the sins of the whole world. He allowed for all of that to be done. And he says, consider him, lest you be wearied and faint in your own minds. Consider what he did for us. And don't forget that Jesus Christ, when he was on his earth, yes, he was God, but he was a man too. He was... He was you know, it says 100% God, 100% man. It's kind of difficult to wrap our minds around that, but he was in the flesh and he had limitations that a man has. And that's why we can go to him boldly because we don't have a high priest that hasn't been tempted like we are. The Bible says that he is tempted in all points like, like as, as we are yet without sin. He knows what it's like to be a human being. He had the physical limitations put upon him, the weariness he was wearied when he walked, when he did his work. He wasn't a superman, you know, like the superhero that just doesn't get tired. He had the flesh to be a weary to him while he was doing this work, yet he still did it. And he's saying, don't be wearied and faint in your minds and just quit and get out of the race. He says, consider Jesus. He says, you haven't resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And I know no one here has resisted unto blood for the cause of Christ, striving against sin. If we haven't even done that yet, let's not be fainting in our, in our minds. Let's not get out. Let's not think it's just too difficult and we can't handle it. Because other people, as our examples, have gone through so much more for us. Jesus Christ being the prime example. Galatians 6 verse 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. As we have opportunity, let us do good. We have a lot of opportunity. We live in an area, there's people all over the place. There's a lot of opportunity. Let us do good. Let us not be weary. Being weary is a choice. I mean, you're, physically you could be wearied, but mentally you can continue. You can choose to keep going. Acts chapter 5. Turn to Acts chapter 5. It's the last place I'm going to have you turn this morning. Acts chapter 5. Very famous passage in Acts chapter 5 there at the end of the chapter. Book of Acts has so many examples of the soul winning. And as I mentioned earlier, the people who have turned the world upside down. Acts is my favorite book of the whole Bible. It always, it always has been. I've, it, from whenever I read through the Bible, I've always loved this book. It's always, it's just, it's so exciting, man. There's so much stuff that's going on there. And it's just, just the, 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 the real, the, the real fervor and the fervent spirit that they had in the face of all opposition. They didn't care what the government said. They didn't care the opposition they faced by the Jews. They kept going and did it anyways because they knew it was right because this is what we have to do because we're serving God. We're serving Jesus Christ, our Lord, and I don't care who you I don't care if you throw me in prison. I don't care if you beat me up. We're going to preach the gospel of Christ and we're going to reach multitudes. That is why Acts is so awesome because they're taking action and they're doing. They're not just sitting at home. They're not just showing up and sitting their butt in a church and then going home and not doing anything. They're getting up on their feet and they're going out and they're preaching the gospel. That's what's awesome about the book of Acts. And I think it stuck out even more to me because I didn't even think there were any churches that were going out and doing anything for Christ up until the point to where I finally ended up going to Faithful Word because the churches I attended, no one was doing anything. No one's doing anything. To me, the book of Acts was a history book. Awesome history, but that didn't even think it was possible anymore until I was encouraged saying, you know what, we can do this too. 
We could go out and have this type of attitude. We could have this type of spirit. We could go out and preach the gospel of Christ just like they did. They didn't do it under their own strength. They did it under the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. The power is still there. Acts chapter 5, look at verse number 40. The Bible reads, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. That last verse here over and over again because it's a soul winning verse. It daily, again, daily, right? That's our goal. That's our challenge. Daily in the month of February. Daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. But we read this in context, and you know what the context is? They were beaten, beaten. They were being thrown in prison. They were suffering a lot of persecution for doing this very thing, and they continued to do it anyways. We're not facing that today. They were able to do this every day, facing that type of persecution, not knowing when they're going out and preaching Christ, whether or not that day they're just going to be arrested and beat up again. We don't have that fear. We have a lot given to us today. You have a lot of opportunity. You don't even have to face that. That's a pretty strong adversary of just that threat of violence. You don't have that. So what's your excuse? We think about this. Consider all that we see in the Bible. Do you really have an excuse to not do what's already been done before under much worse circumstances? Now, I want to give you just a few tips in closing how to accomplish our goal, how to accomplish this challenge of preaching the gospel to at least one person every single day because we don't have soul winning times every day. Right? We've got soul winning times on Wednesdays and on Sundays. So how are we going to do this? Well, you need to be seeking people out. What I did during my, uh, the challenge with, with Brother Donnie, with Pastor Romero, he, um, you know, I would be driving home and my commute between work and my home is about 20 minutes. And so if you see somebody walking on the street, you pull over. You turn around, you pull up whatever direction they're going, you go like a block or two down. Then you get out and just pretend like you're walking down the street too. And you go, oh, hey. You know, because you don't want to be too awkward of just stopping right there in front of them. But hey, you know, if that's what you need to do, do that too, right? Whatever. I would be a little bit, a little bit more, um, you know, nonchalant about it and, and kind of go up and say, oh, hey, doesn't matter. You see people out. Uh, what I'm going to be doing, because I'll tell you what, this is, this is a challenge for me, and it's not going to be necessarily easy for me to do either. I work a full-time job. And, I, and I'll challenge you if you say, I'm too busy to do this, come and compare your schedule with me. Anyone who thinks that they're too busy to, to, to do this challenge, come and compare your schedule with me, and, I, and we'll see if you're too busy. Okay? But for, I, I drive down to, to Phoenix and back twice a week, three and a half hours round trip driving. And most of that, I'm not seeing anybody out on the street because it's almost all freeway, okay? But what I'm going to be doing is I need to get gas for that trip. So my plan is I'm going to hang out at the gas station until I see somebody that I can approach and give the gospel to. That's not hard. And especially because when I'm when, on my way home, I'm going to be coming back, you know, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Plenty of people still out at that point. It's not like it's 1 or 2 in the morning. You need to be able to, to find an opportunity. You don't always have to knock doors. Hey, if you want to knock doors, knock doors. Go to a mall. Go to a shopping store. Go to Walmart. There's always people in Walmart. Walmart's open all the time. You say, the only time I have is at 3 in the morning. Go to Walmart. And if there's no shoppers, talk to the, to the cashier. Okay? They're, 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 the opportunity is there. Or how about this? Because you've got a lot of days to do this. Why not call an old friend? Why don't you call a relative? Talk to someone you haven't talked to in a long time. Call them up and give them the gospel. Do it over the phone. But give the God, try to give the gospel to one person every single day. I mean, we, do, we do a lot of things. There's a lot of people out in this town. It's a small town, but there's plenty of people. You just have to have it 
conscious in your mind that you are going to do this and that you care about the child and you say, you know, I'm going to do this and, and, and make it something you're thinking about. If you're thinking about it, you could do it. It's about right as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we can receive through all the great stories in the Bible, dear Lord, for the men of God that have done so much for you, for, that, have, that have worked so hard, that have had this mindset of serving others, dear Lord, and not just worried about themselves and, and how comfortable they can get. Lord, I know this is, this is going to be uncomfortable for our church, but I pray that you please help us all to find the strength to, to do this and to, um, and to push ourselves to do more for you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.